I was born in South Germany in the city of Karlsruhe and as a schoolboy we moved my family moved to Holland and uh, lived quite close to the North Sea and I think that's where my love of the oceans started and then I spent most of my youth on Lake Constance in South Germany I also um, I was very interested in science already from being a, a young boy and at the age of 12 I was certain that I wanted to become a scientist and I never had any doubts about that ever after and uh, I did a lot of experiments as a boy and so on and as a schoolboy I spent many afternoons in uh, the university library in Constance and uh, studied books uh, mostly on astronomy and cosmology. That was what I was very interested in at the time. Naturally, I then uh, started to study physics and uh, first at the universities of Ulm and Constance in Germany. And I also spent a year abroad in uh, University of Wales in Bangor studying physical oceanography. My first uh, thesis was on a question of general relativity theory, so that was going back to this cosmology issue. Um, but then for my PhD, I went into physical oceanography and did my PhD in New Zealand at the Victoria University of Wellington. And after that, I moved back to Germany and spent my uh, five postdoc years at the Marine Science Institute in Kiel on the Baltic and there I started to become interested in the question of stability of ocean circulation and after that I then moved to the relatively new institute for climate impact research that was uh, started up after the wall came down in Potsdam in uh, former East Germany and uh, I became a professor of physics of the oceans there at Potsdam University in the year 2000. Apart from science, I am uh, interested in everything outdoors from swimming, hiking, kayaking, surfing, skiing and things like that. I also enjoy dancing. I like photography. I'm married and I have two children that are in primary school now, so I spend a lot of time thinking about the kind of world that we are leaving to our children. I spent quite a bit of time in the last years studying global sea level rise and I think have contributed to uh, reshaping the discussion there that basically started because uh, in the discussion in the preparation of the force assessment report of the IPCC I as many colleagues uh, was convinced that the IPCC underestimated the risk of sea level rise and uh, as we know now in the fifth assessment report, the projections for sea level rise are about 60% higher than they were in the fourth assessment report. Um, a, a quite a new topic that we have been studying in my group in the last uh, couple of years is the role of planetary waves in the atmosphere for extreme weather events. That's a very exciting new research topic that is discussed a lot now. Um, and it has to do with the big waves in the jet stream that circles uh, the mid-latitudes and whenever this jet stream uh, throws very large meanders uh, there is very extreme weather on the ground and uh, there is indications that this jet stream is actually changing probably because of the disproportionate warming of the Arctic which changes the temperature contrast between the tropics and the high latitudes, uh, which is basically the reason for why this uh, jet stream exists. And also recently I have revisited one of, revisited, uh, one of my earliest research topics, namely the Gulf Stream system in the North Atlantic and its stability. And uh, while for many years there has been a concern that this uh, ocean circulation system could be weakening in response to global warming, uh, we think we have now some reasonable uh, evidence that it has actually weakened already noticeably over the course of the 20th century.
uh, for quite a few years, there has not been any more scientific uh, serious debate about uh, this issue because simply the evidence is so overwhelming. And uh, that is why we have a huge scientific consensus of uh, at least 97% of all experts that human activities are the dominant cause of global warming, at least since the middle of the 20th century. The general public, however, is not very well aware of this consensus because the media present quite a confused picture about this uh, because of basically the role of uh, special interest groups running very well-funded campaign and uh, parading self-declared uh, experts that are not actual climate scientists uh, deliberately confusing the general public about this issue. One aspect of that overwhelming consensus is the fact that in Paris in December 2015, uh, 195 countries, practically every country on Earth, agreed to reduce emissions uh, basically to zero later in this century in order to stop global warming well below two degrees. Um, and that, that just shows that not even countries against whose immediate interest this goes, like oil producing countries, for example, Saudi Arabia, dispute anymore that humans are causing global warming. In my view, the Paris Agreement is a, a big victory for scientific reason, because the, the goals that are set there, limiting global warming to well below two degrees and the ambition to get close to 1.5 degrees, are scientifically based. It's based on the work that scientists have done demonstrating the various risks that we run when we uh, go beyond this amount of global warming. And it's also been a huge victory of diplomacy. I think the, the French have done a fantastic job there. It's in a way, it's the mother nation of diplomacy. And getting so many countries with such diverse interests to sign on to a binding agreement with such far-reaching consequences, that is quite an achievement. And what ultimately it means is the end of the era of fossil fuels, because there is no other way to stop global warming. Of course, whether the Paris Agreement was indeed a historic turning point in the fight against global warming, we cannot say now. We will be able to judge that maybe in 20 years' time, looking back, uh, and this will depend entirely on whether uh, the promises and the ambition and the goals of Paris are actually implemented. That is definitely uh, not over yet. There's a beginning of that battle because this will be a battle against kind of short-term and national interests on many different levels. So uh, I think historically this Paris Agreement is a big success. The main criticism that you can raise is that it came rather late, it pretty well exactly 50 years, half a century after the first uh, scientific expert panel warned the US President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965 of the imminent dangers of further emissions of carbon dioxide and the global warming they would cause. So it's taken us half a century of debate until finally all nations agreed to this uh, historic um, treaty. And uh, I think now there will be a further ongoing uh, effort needed by all citizens of this world in the interest of uh, the future of humanity to get their own governments to implement this agreement. If we fail to stop warming below 2 degrees or actually below 1.5 degrees, I think we run a very large and basically incalculable risks for humanity. That's, I think, a key point. Some people think stopping global warming is some kind of environmental issue. This is not about the environment. This is about preventing human suffering at a massive scale. We already see the effects of the one degree global warming that we have experienced thus far. To give you uh, one example, the number of record-breaking monthly heat waves around the world 
is now five times larger than it would be just by chance in an unchanging climate. So four out of five uh, devastating heat waves uh, that occur now are human caused. And as we speak, we have India suffering for the last weeks from such a heat wave uh, with the ash felt on the roads melting and temperatures above 50 degrees centigrade being measured. We have the problem of sea level rise. Sea level rise is a logical consequence of global warming and the projections uh, of sea level rise have been getting more and more pessimistic. Uh, the latest uh, scientific work on modeling the Antarctic ice sheet by colleagues from the United States uh, have shown that even up to two meters of sea level rise uh, overall could be possible by the end of this century. And even more importantly, sea level rise is a very long-term process that is not going to stop even after we stopped global warming. It will go on for centuries to come. And even with two degrees warming, we may well end up with several meters of sea level rise in the coming centuries. So from the point of view of preventing sea level rise and uh, saving coastal cities and small island nations, even two degrees is probably already too much. We cannot uh, even uh, describe all the risks of global warming, uh, for example, tipping points in the climate system where there's irreversible changes, the risk of rising drought problems, etc. Uh, not everything is predictable and well understood, but it is basically like entering a minefield where we don't know exactly where the mines are, but even if we're not exactly sure where these are, I think everybody would agree that it's foolish to enter such a minefield.